Love it. I just want you guys to know that I love you guys. I doubt it, bro. I doubt it. I doubt it. No, I I love that you love me. I love you guys, and I'm uh, happy to be here. All right, um, last week, if you could just turn this up a smidge so I don't have to have it so close to my mouth. Can you turn it up a little bit just so I so I don't got to be like, I don't want to eat the mic. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I want to eat it. Turn it up, 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 up. All right, that's good. Perfect. Um, last week, we started a new series called Missing Peace, and we talked about peace, not P. Uh, how's it spelled? P I E A C P I E C E. Woo. Peace, like a puzzle piece, but peace. P E A C E. I'm not ready for all the spelling. I'm tired, guys. Um, but we talked about missing peace. You know, we look around in our world and we see that there's missing peace everywhere we look. Right? Sometimes it's in our families, in our schools. Can anybody give me a quick wave? Your school is missing peace. Sometimes there's a lot of fighting, a lot of craziness, a lot of drama, missing peace, um, right? Um, in our world, we look out in our world, and our world is missing peace. And so last week, we talked about how God is the God of peace over and over and over. In the New Testament, we see that God is referred to as the God of of peace. It's who he is. We saw that Jesus is the prince of peace. We saw that God's kingdom is not a kingdom. It's not about, uh, not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy. God's kingdom is a kingdom of peace. We learned that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The fruit of the Spirit in your life is peace. We saw that Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. So we learned that God is a peacemaker, not I'm sorry, that God is a God of peace. And this, uh, this week, we're going to learn that God, as, as we're following God, who's a God of peace, and we're his followers, that we should be people of peace. Can anybody agree with me on that? We should be people of peace. We should be peaceful people. And when we look around our world, we look around at our families, we look around at our schools, and we see that peace is missing. And my question is, could that be because the peacemakers are missing. Could that be because there's not enough peacemakers in the world, right? Your school may be missing peace and there's fighting and there's craziness and there's people hating everybody and each other. And maybe because you haven't risen up as a peacemaker in your school yet. Maybe there's a missing peace. There's missing peace because there's not enough peacemakers. I'm gonna read this scripture Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Can we read that together? <laughs> Put it back up. Oh, it crashed. <laughs> okay. We good? All right. Can we read that together? Everybody. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. All right, I want to pray, and then I want to get into this. So God, I just thank you for this night. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace, that you have made peace between us and God through the shedding of your blood, that you have made us friends of God, and we are loved by God, and there is no hostility. There's peace between us and God. You've given us the gift of peace through your Holy Spirit that we would have peace on the inside of us, Lord Jesus. But tonight I ask that you would help us to become people of peace and peacemakers, that we would go into the situations in our lives and look around and, and see where we can bring the peace of God and make peace, Lord. Help us to pick up this identity that we would be peacemakers, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the first thing that I want to do tonight is our main scripture is Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. It's part of the Beatitudes. Does anybody know one other Beatitude? Anybody? Yeah, blessed are the meek, for, their, for they will inherit. Yeah, will inherit the earth. No. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. You got two of them mixed together. It's perfect. Walker, you got one? 
Okay. Anybody have another one? Okay. That's all right. Read Matthew chapter 5 at home tonight, tomorrow, something. But Jesus goes through and he gives these beatitudes. And they're, they're the attitudes that we should have in our life. They're the way that we should live our life and the way that we should gauge whether our lives are blessed or not. And he flips the common idea of what it means to be blessed on its head. You know, people say you're really blessed if you got a lot of money. You, you say, man, you're really blessed if you're really healthy. You, you're really blessed if you have uh, a nice house or nice cars. Or maybe you're really blessed if you've got a lot of followers on social media. But Jesus says, no, you're really blessed. You're really blessed if you're a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So I want to slowly, I want us to meditate on this verse, think on this verse tonight for a few minutes, um, and slowly go through this verse, and then I want to just share a couple of different things about peacemaking and what that really looks like and what that is, uh, what God is calling us to do. So I want to read this again. Everybody put, put on your spiritual ears, okay? Put on your spiritual ears. I don't see you put them on. Put them on, okay? Spiritual ears on. Listen to God's word. And I want you to receive God's word. I want you to um, receive what God is saying tonight. I'm going to read through this slowly, and then I'm going to take it piece by piece, and we're going to talk about each piece. So again, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be called a child of God. I want to be known as a child of God. So the first part of this verse here says, blessed, blessed are. Blessed are. It is blessed to be a peacemaker. The word in the Greek for blessed is makarios, which means happy or fortunate. Literally, Jesus is saying, hey, you are fortunate. You are, your, your life is happy is good if you're a peacemaker, okay? All the different things in our lives that we, we look to to be happy is peacemaking on the list, right? Is, is being a peacemaker on your list of things that are gonna make you happy in life? Probably not. I'd, I'd be honest, I'd say like, that's not in my frame of reference. Like, that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking, man, if I could just really make some peace today between two people, I would be happy. But it should be on our list. Making peace between people that are fighting or hostile against each other and restoring relationships should be on our list of what makes us happy, what, what constitutes a good life. He says, blessed. Everybody say, blessed are. Blessed are. Next part, the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So real quick, can anybody just give me their best idea or definition of what is a peacemaker? How would you describe that? Jaden? Oh, it looks like, I don't know, your hand was up like this. I was like. Yeah, someone diffusing arguments and things similar. That's a good way to look at it. Anybody have any other ideas? It's not a trick question. No? Okay, I'm going to read this um, just simple definition here. A, peace, a peacemaker or peacemaking is the act of cultivating right relationships between friends, families, communities, and even our enemies. Listen to what I said, cultivating right relationships. Peace is needed when there's hostility, okay? If you want to rewind the clock and think about your relationship with God, there was a point in time where you needed peace with God because, because of your sin. Your sin was hostile towards God, and Jesus died on the cross for you so that there's no more hostility, okay? He fixed that relationship, has anybody here ever had a, a situation with their parents where there was some hostility, okay? Anybody? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, he says. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Where there's hostility, where there's, there's no peace there, right? 
right? When you're, when you're in a fight with your parents, when your parents are fighting with you, where you're not doing what you're supposed to, let's be honest, okay? You're always doing what you're supposed to do? I don't believe you, Adam. I don't believe him for a second. I don't believe him for a second. <laughs> But you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes there's relationships where there's hostility, there's a rift, there's a disagreement, there's an argument, and now there's distance, and now there's space. Now there's, there, there's somebody's angry at somebody else, and we don't want to talk anymore. Has anybody had a, ever had a friendship that went that way? You know what I'm talking about? And there's a hostility, okay? A peacemaker restores right relationship between two parties that are hostile. That's, what, that's all a peacemaker does. That's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker is more concerned with relationship than being right, okay? One of the things that keeps you from being a peacemaker is if you have to be the one that's right every time. If you're always the one, I'm right, and they're, they gotta, I'm not going to budge on this, you know? You know they're, they don't know anything. I'm right. You're, you're not going to be a peacemaker if you're more concerned about being right than you are about restoring relationships. And that's what a peacemaker does, is that they, they, they bring people together, they restore relationships, and sometimes it's even in a whole community. You know, there could be a whole community that's just filled, like, you know, at school, at your lunch table, there could be a whole table that everybody's just like, there's like a stink in the air, you know what I'm talking about? There's like some kind of stink in the air, and everybody, everybody's mad at everybody else, everybody hates everybody else. You, you need to be a peacemaker in that situation and find some way with God's help to restore those relationships, okay? A peacemaker jumps into situations to bring peace. So blessed are the peacemakers. Everybody say the peacemakers. The peacemakers. Okay. Next part, for they will be. For they will be. Be. So if you think about this whole verse, it says, blessed are the peacemakers for. When it says for, you got to ask, what's it there for? No, no laugh? Come on. Whatever. When, it's, when, it's, when the word for, you got to ask, why is it there, okay? It's saying that the blessing is not even connected to being a peacemaker, but because you're a peacemaker, you're a child of God, and being a child of God is a blessing, Okay? It's not so much even that, man, I'm going to make peace, I'm going to make peace. But in the act of making peace, you'll be called a child of God. You will image your father. And in that way, man, you are blessed. Okay? Just to the next one. Go to the next one. Called children of God. Peacemaking should become part of our identity because it's who God is. God is a peacemaker. He sent his son to die for us on the cross to make peace with us so that we would have a relationship with us. And because of that, when we are peacemakers, we are like our heavenly father. We are walking as children of God. When somebody says, you know, you're a child of this this guy or this movement or this thing, what they're saying is like you are you are like that person you're a child of. Okay, when we are called children of God it's because. We're like our Father in heaven. We're becoming like him. That peacemaking becomes part of our identity because God is a peacemaker. That phrase, being a a child or children of of your Father in heaven or or God, um, is used again later in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says this. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies. Everybody say, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Everybody say, pray for those who persecute you. That you may be, oh, there it is. Again, be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. What is the scripture saying? Saying, hey, just like to be a peacemaker. He's not saying be a peacemaker with the people you like. He's saying even your enemies. Even the people that hate you or you hate, you got to shut that down and you need to love your enemies. You need to pray for them and you need to make peace with them. Why? Because then you will be a child of your father in heaven. Then you will be like God who loved his enemies so much that he sent his son to die for his enemies. 
Come on, I, I've been thinking about the cross so much because we, we just came out of Easter. And, um, and, you know, Jesus is on the cross. He had just been brutally um, tortured, okay? He was beyond recognizable. Like, they couldn't even, you couldn't even say, like, yeah, that's Jesus. He was so beaten, bruised, bloody, on the cross, every breath hurt, okay? That, that was the pain of, of the cross in that way that they used to torture people. You'd be up there, and literally taking breaths is what hurt the most because to take a breath, your whole body had to go and move, and you have nails in your hands. You have nails in your feet. You, you are stuck there, and every breath is excruciating. And Jesus, on the cross, faced with his enemies, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus loved his enemies. The ones who were torturing him, killing him. He was literally in the act of dying, and he forgave them. It's amazing. That's the kind of peacemaking we're called to. That's the kind of person we're called to be, that we would be people who bring peace in even the most volatile, crazy, challenging situations. When people hate us, we're going to love them. When people spit on us and, 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 and mock our name and mock Jesus, we're going to love them. We are going to care for them. We are going to pray for them. Okay? And when Jesus says pray for those who persecute you, he's not saying pray against those who persecute you. Shut them down in Jesus' name. No. He's saying pray for their good. That's what he's talking about. That their lives would be touched. That their lives would be blessed. That their lives would be changed. That's what a peacemaker does. They want to get in there and they want to fix the situation because they, they love the people involved. We're called to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. I want to give just a couple of observations about peacemaking, what it is and what it isn't. Okay, just go to the next slide. First thing, peacemaking is not peacekeeping. Everybody say peacemaking is not peacekeeping. Okay, Big difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping. Most people are peacekeepers, okay? And if I'm honest, I'm more of a peacekeeper than a peacemaker sometimes in my life, for sure. What does a peacekeeper do? A peacekeeper ignores issues that need to be resolved. We just got to keep the peace. I don't want to cause any waves. I don't want to cause any issues. We got to keep the peace, everybody. Peacekeeping maintains a false appearance of peace while there's anger, hate, malice bubbling below the surface. There's still an issue, but it's peace. You know, we don't want to cause any issues, okay? Very different between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. It reminds me of several times in, in Scripture in the Old Testament, there's these prophetic books, and there would be times where the prophets, um, there would be false prophets, who were basically telling people everything they wanted to hear. And God was like, come on, guys. Like, he judged that. He was very upset about that. And there's a situation here in Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 14. It says, they have treated my people's brokenness superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Leave that up for a second. That's a peacekeeper. Those prophets... We're walking around telling everybody, peace, peace, everything's great, everything's fine, peace, peace. And God is judging those prophets because he says, hey, my people's brokenness is below the surface, it's deep, there's issues. He says, they treated my people's brokenness superficially. They're saying, peace, peace, it's okay, don't worry about it, everything's great. Have you guys ever seen the meme? I wish I had it. With It's, it's like the dog sitting with the coffee, it's a cartoon, and it's inside like a, it's like a house or something, and it's totally on fire, everything's on fire, and he's like, everything's fine. You know what I'm talking about? That's a peacekeeper. That's what a peacekeeper does. That everything's fine, don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't bring it up. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody says, well, we don't talk about that? You know what I'm talking about? Well, we don't, it's best you don't go there. 
Okay, we just leave that right there in the corner there. And that's a peacekeeper. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. Here's another scripture with an even better image. It's in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10. Since they have led my people astray, again, these false prophets astray by saying peace when there is no peace. And look at this illustration. And since when a flimsy wall is being built, they plaster it with whitewash. Therefore, tell those plastering it with whitewash that it will fall. Now, go back. Just so you understand what it's talking about, the image, basically, there's a process of, of taking like plaster, and we still do that sometimes for buildings. Um, not a ton in America, and not a ton like today, but um, probably the sanctuary is old enough that it is lumber that's plastered, right, Jared? Like some of it, probably somewhere. But anyway, plaster—it's a—it's um, a building material that's that—that's uh, like I don't know. It's plaster. You know, you take it, you slap it on, you, know, you slather it. That's a done wall, done. Um, but what God was saying here when He was using this picture is He's saying, "Hey, you guys are building a really crappy wall." Okay, imagine they built like a wall out of cardboard and then they tried to finish it with the same plaster stuff. So it looked like it was a finished wall. It looked like a good wall. But guess what? It's going to fall apart. Why? Because beneath the surface, there's an issue and you've covered it up. That's what a peacekeeper does. Okay, it's the same as like painting over mold with cheap paint. Okay, like you're like, ah, it's not a problem. It's gone. I got it. You know, (laughs) You know, it's gone. No, it's still there. It's beneath the surface. Okay? It's still there no matter how pretty you paint it. It's kind of like putting a Band-Aid over a gunshot wound. Okay? And the bullet's still inside. You're like, I got it. You're good. Yeah, you're good. No, no, no. Don't look under there. Don't look under there. You know, you're like, what is this? What is, you know, you try to take it. No, 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 no. It's good. You're good. Okay? It's like putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig, okay? All right, but that's what a peacekeeper does, all those things. That's what a peacekeeper does. They say peace when there's no peace. They want to keep the status quo. They want to just keep it going. They say, oh, we don't talk about that. For the peace, we got to keep it, for unity, for for all these things, we got to keep it together. Don't, Don't address that issue beneath the surface. And they actually avoid the process that would bring true and lasting peace. And again, this reminds me of Jesus, who's the ultimate peacekeeper. Just a few days before he bled and died on the cross so that we would have peace with God. He was entering into Jerusalem. It was Palm Sunday. He enters into Jerusalem, and um, they're praising and worshiping him. They're celebrating him, but they have no clue what Jesus is about to do. They're going to totally miss it, and Jesus knows it. And he's approaching Jerusalem. He sees the city, and he begins to cry. He begins to weep. And the Bible says this in verse 42 of Luke. Let's go to the next part. And it says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. See, Jesus' ministry, what he did on this earth was not to bring peace between the Israelites and the Romans because that's what the people really wanted, They wanted the Romans to get packing and get moving and get out of there so that they'd have their freedom. But Jesus said, no, this is not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring you peace between you and God because you guys need it. And what the Pharisees were saying was like, Jesus, you're not here. We don't want what you have. We don't want what you're doing. No, 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 peace, peace, it's all good. And Jesus said, if you only knew what would really bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. And that's what a peacekeeper does. And that's what we do. So much, so many times we want to keep the peace. But God, Jesus, calls us to be peacemakers. It's different than peacekeeping. Peacekeeping covers it up, keeps things the way they are, doesn't address the issues. But a peacemaker oftentimes has to peel back the scab or the whatever. You know, it's, it'll hurt a little bit. But to truly fix the problem, sometimes you need to do surgery. And who wants to have surgery? I don't know. I don't want to have surgery. John John wants to have surgery. Crazy. 
I just want to have surgery. (laughs) But it hurts, but it corrects the problem. It fixes the problem for real and brings true and lasting peace. And that's what a peacemaker is called to do. Okay, next. Peacemaking is non-violent. There was this phrase that was very popular for a very long time and sometimes still used in the Latin. It's si vis pacem parabellum. Does anybody know what that is? Any Latin, Latin scholars? Okay. If you want peace, prepare for war. And that is a phrase that has been popular with nations and peoples for 1,500 years. Okay, there's an idea that if you want peace, then you have to be willing to um, to force it, to make it happen, to to um, to dominate, to defeat, to destroy, to go to war, to do violence against others, because it's all in the name of peace. Jesus would have been familiar with this statement when he said, "Blessed are the peacemakers," because again, he was in Jerusalem. He was in uh, an occupied territory. The Jewish people were occupied by the Romans, and they were oppressing them. They were second-class citizens. They they they, They didn't have their freedom. And there were groups. We talked about this last week a little bit. There were groups in the Jewish people called the Zealots who said, we are going to take back our, our land, our property, our place. We're going to take it back by violent force. We're going to overthrow the Roman occupation. And you really see this when Jesus goes before Pilate to be tried. And, and Pilate's like, I can't find anything wrong with this guy. And then he puts him up on the stand, and, and they had a tradition to release one prisoner a year. And he asked the people, who do you want me to release, Jesus or, does anybody know the guy's name? Barabbas, right? And the Bible says that Barabbas was a revolutionary. He was a rebel. He was a zealot. And it says that he murdered somebody. Okay? What? (laughs) He was a murderer. Jesus never did anything wrong in his life. Versus the guy who, who, who's trying to overthrow the government, trying to overthrow everything, had killed people. And the people choose Barabbas. Why? Because in the air, in Jesus' time, there was a strong sentiment of we got to shed as much blood as we have to to get the peace we're looking for. And to these people, Jesus says, no, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God, the children of God. You know, it's interesting. If you study church history, the church for about 300 years were completely pacifists. You know what a pacifist is? Not past the fist. No. Do you know what a pacifist is? So They don't believe in fighting, don't believe in violence. They're saying, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to. I'm not going to hurt somebody else no matter what it is. And um, for 300 years, the church was nonviolent. They even had rules that um, you couldn't serve in the military because you'd have to hurt people. And they said um, if, you, uh, if you got caught in the serving, you get kicked out of the church. But then when Rome made Christianity the state-sponsored religion, all of a sudden those positions seemed to start changing because Rome still had wars to fight and territories to take. Hmm. I wonder why. Huh. I don't know. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? You get what I'm saying? The church used to be like, we're not going to fight. We're not going to We're not gonna do anything violent no matter what, it, what the cost. And then the church had some power and was part, was mixed in with the Roman government and the government still needs to keep moving and expanding and keep. So things began to change. But I really think our imagination of what peacemaking looks like needs to expand, needs to grow beyond having a bigger stick. You know, has anybody ever heard of that? It's like, who, who, who's going to win? It's the guy with the biggest stick. You know, it's like, I, I think our idea of making peace needs to expand beyond violence and to look like Jesus looked. How did Jesus make peace? Through taking violence upon himself on the cross and dying. He could have smoked those guys, right? 
He could have called down legions of angels. He could have fought. He could have, he could have, he could have destroyed the entire Roman Empire like that. Right? Was he the son of God or was he not? Right? He could have destroyed the Roman Empire like that, but he said, nope, I'm not going to use that system of violence anymore. I'm not going to use that system. I am not going to do it. I'm actually going to take the violence on myself and I'm going to die so that everyone can have peace with God. All right, peacemaking is non violent. Next one. I like this one. Peacemaking is a pursuit. Peacemaking is something that we need to value. It's something that we need to pursue. Peace doesn't happen naturally. Like, have you ever seen two people that just like hate each other for, the, for like their whole lives just naturally drift towards peace with one another, right? Probably not. Something happens to cause peace, right? Peacemaking needs to be a pursuit. It needs to be something that we fight for. Something that we go after. The Bible describes it like this several places. In 1 Peter 3, 10 and 11, it says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. And Peter there is quoting Psalm 34, 14. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and everybody say, pursue it. Pursue it. Hebrews 12 14 says, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see God. Make sure that no one fail, falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. What's it saying? If you don't figure those situations out, a root of bitterness is going to spring up and many people are going to be defiled. What do you mean? Well, have you ever met a bitter person and it just drags everybody down with them? He says, be at peace with everybody. Pursue peace. And then this verse is a little bit longer, but I want to read it. It's in Romans 12, 16 through 21. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Hmm. Kids, in your schools, there is no instinct in your body or in the kids around you to associate with the humble. The instinct is I need to get with the cool kids. The instinct is I need to get on the in crowd. The instinct is I need to do something that, that gets me, that makes me accepted by others. But associate with the humble. Who's the kid that nobody wants to talk to and just kind of, uh, that, that just kind of goes under the radar but is kind? Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, lean into this, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Okay? Just keep that up there for a second. Everybody say, if possible... As far as it depends on me, I'm going to live at peace. Okay? As far as it depends on, I love that picture. It's like as far as, as, far as you can, okay? There are some times, I'm going to tell you this right now. Your attempts to make peace won't work. Exactly. There are going to be times in your life where you're like, I know I'm called to be a peacemaker. I'm trying to make peace, but it's still not working out. It's not happening. I don't know. I, I'm trusting in God. I'm praying. I'm, uh, I'm doing what I'm, I'm loving. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's still not working. You can't control people. He says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You're going to do your best and what you can do and what God can do through you. That's it. Verse 19, friends. Do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. What is that saying? He's saying you don't need to get even with anybody. You never have to get even with anybody. 
Okay, when Jesus says turn the other cheek, he means it. You don't have to get even, God's got it. But verse 20 says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will heap, be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. We are in a day and age where people think you've got to fight fire with fire. If they're going to play dirty, we're going to play dirty. I'm telling you, there are Christians all over the place that are trying to use the ways of the world to get God's mission done. And it's not the way to go. You can't act like Satan to get Jesus glorified, right? Like, there, it doesn't work. He says, don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. All of these things help us to make peace, to love our enemies, to serve our enemies, to help them, to bless them, to conquer evil with good. But I love that. Live at peace with everyone as far as it depends on you. You. So peace is something that we have to pursue, to pursuit. So how do we become peacemakers? I want to share a scripture, one last scripture, and connect the dots here. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, everyone say the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, what's that? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit of God in your life, part of it is peace. Now, if you study these, this scripture, it's not talking about things for you, okay? The love isn't so you feel good. The joy isn't so you feel good. The, the peace isn't so you feel peace inside, okay? Patience, so I'm more patient for me. It's in the context of a community that is very divided. And he says, people are walking by the flesh, and there's division, there's enmity, there's anger, there's all these issues and factions and all this stuff because people are walking by the flesh and they're biting and devouring each other. But then he says, no, but not so with you guys. If you walk by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, love for one another. Joy is the way we interact with one another in community. Peace between one another. It's not talking about peace in your heart and mind. Jesus talks about that other places. But the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life includes you being a peacemaker. That you would become a person, that we become people of peace. And we need to spend time with Jesus for that fruit to grow in our lives. We need to have a relationship with God. Like if we just walk out of here and say, now we're gonna try really hard. We need, we need to pursue peace, but with God's help. If we walk out of here and say, I'm just gonna be a peacemaker, I'm gonna try really hard, then I think we're missing something because really it is God transforming us into his image that's gonna do it. Like, we need God to change us. We need God to help us. We need the Spirit of God to transform us from the inside out because our inclination is not peace. Our default is not peace. We need God's help to be peacemakers. We need that fruit to grow in our lives. So two ways for us to respond to this tonight. Number one is to ask Jesus for help, admit your weakness, and receive his grace to be a peacemaker. Like, you need to ask Jesus for help. Does anybody, raise your hand right now, do you wanna be a peacemaker? Come on. Then we need to ask Jesus for help. I'm gonna lead us in a prayer right now, and I want you, with your own lips, with your own words, you're gonna ask Jesus, help me to be a peacemaker. Simple as that. But we need to ask him for help. So I'm gonna do that prayer, and then we're gonna move on. God, I just thank you for this night, and we just ask you tonight, Lord, that you would help us to be peacemakers, that you would help us not to be peace takers or peacekeepers, Lord, but that you would help us to be people of peace from the inside out that you transform us. God, I'm asking that for every person here that you would grow the fruit of peace in us. 
Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, that you would transform us and change us. Help us take away the anger, the impatience with others. Help us to or take away the pride that says we have to be right and we can't admit any faults and we can't restore relationships until they admit they're wrong. God, help us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would make us peacemakers from the inside out. We ask you for help tonight, Lord. Send your spirit, who is that gift of peace. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you need to ask for help. I want to encourage you to keep asking Jesus to help you be a peacemaker. Number two is the practical. Look for places in your life that are missing peace, okay? Your, maybe your family, your school, your, your neighborhood. Maybe it's a situation you heard about in the news and maybe you can't go, but you can pray, right? So look for places that are missing peace. Ask God to open your eyes to show you, like, what, where do I need to be a peacemaker? Where can I be a peacemaker? And begin to ask God for those opportunities to enter into the situation and bring peace, okay? Simple. You with me? All right. Well, that's it. We're done. Small groups, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to pray for each other in our small groups too. All right? See you later online.